Okay, very good morning to everyone. Happy Friday, 21st of June. I uh, thought I'd put on my, my 90s Nike tennis top because Andy Murray is back. One triumphant in doubles with Feliciano Lopez at Queens. And he's going to be entering Wimbledon, he's confirmed, but not singles, doubles and mixed doubles. So, Andy, I know you watch the briefing every morning. Hope you're not feeling too sore with the hip. And uh, good to have you back on board. But let's crack on. What are we discussing in the briefing this morning? A um, few different things. Uh, predominantly going to focus on this story to the side of me at the moment because this has been a slowly kind of grinding away throughout the week and you know quite it's kind of behind the kind of cloud of the, the, the Fed and the trade war. These tensions in the Middle East certainly warrant monitoring closely going forward and going to talk you through a few different things in, in a moment about what my thoughts are and how the US might respond and, and what the likelihood is of engagement and how that could influence prices or not going forward. So we'll get on to that in a second, but just having a look at the broader uh, asset classes at the moment, again, just to refresh your memory, I've got uh, Euro dollar, top left cable, gold, top right. Gold, just a quick word, well, you know, gold has had a pretty phenomenal run, actually. I mean, the biggest move, of course, coming uh, in the wake of well, actually, when you actually look at the Fed move, what was quite interesting, and you know, certainly this is when fundamental forces often act as a catalyst and then exacerbated by combination of timing and uh, liquidity at certain parts of the day, which would be this bigger spike because that actually came overnight in the Asia Pacific session, not in the immediate aftermath of the actual uh, FOMC decision on Wednesday night. Um, and also, obviously, technical breaches of long-term levels. Now that we're up at these levels, uh, in gold, having gone through 1400 overnight. You know, that was the actual FOMC move. This was the move that came overnight, kind of grind it up and then pop. You can see there the psychological level of 1400 and what that means for prices. You get that extra pop. Not that there was any fresh news, purely a kind of technical breach. And, you know, the reason for that, you know, if you start looking at the daily continuation here, I mean, last time we were up at these levels, you've got to go quite a way back here. Uh, so, Gold obviously elevated. I mean, if I just flip over the stories here, a lot of the press talking about this obviously this morning. Uh, 1400, buoyed by dovish central banks. Remember, you know, kind of Bank of England slightly aside, because a little bit more balanced on the, the inflation risks that are present. But everyone else, you know, remember we started the beginning of the week, Mario Draghi incredibly dovish that week in the euro and saw Bund shoot higher. Uh, you've had the Fed say, committing to easing, 100% now priced in for a cut in a few weeks' time at the end of July. Bank of Japan kind of holding pat, willing to do more as well. And then also you've got the trade tensions, but now the US-Iran tensions uh, to boot also kind of helping elevate prices and, and the protection of kind of these traditional safe havens. So yeah, definitely waking up um, to a strong degree. But otherwise, other asset classes, uh, I didn't think it was that surprising to see the S&P, you know, this, again, it's quite, quite behavioral in that sense. You know, we, we rallied so aggressively over the course of the last couple of weeks. Obviously got a, a catalyst, fresh catalyst with the Fed, uh, helping bump things up as well with some of the Trump tweets that we had at the beginning of the week uh, when he was talking up the prospect of lengthy talks with China at the G20. And, you know, obvious target then for for the short term kind of speculators is you know retesting of the all time high which we did yesterday and hit that objective given the the kind of scope of the move now that we've had i think probably about right unless there's a fresh reason or piece of news that comes out to kind of hit that logical area of resistance and books and profits on those trades so to see the s&p come off a little yesterday uh, you can see as soon as it did hit it at the open of wall street it was quite a quite a decent pullback at the time but you can again see how technical this market is it hits that kind of all-time high level comes back down where does it come back down to well it comes back down to the technical point of what was resistance in the prior day's session of the week then where does it move back up to well has a retest at the high and now we're kind of consolidating within that range so you know quite a nice response here to uh, the technical levels, the psychological markers, the all-time high, the pullback level, uh, and now this kind of range trade. So, I mean, for me, I know Sam will look at this in more detail. If Unless the S&P really pushes up to that upper bound or 
reverse down to the lower, then I'm not really that interested now going forward into the S&P, quite frankly. Uh, but yeah, obviously interesting to see what Sam's take is. Otherwise, T-notes uh, down a touch, but pretty flat. Oil uh, unchanged, but obviously a, a big week for oil, uh, just given the, the US-Iran tensions that have been flaring up, of course. Uh, Sterling-wise, we'll have a little update on the Tory front. Uh, but again, that's not really a market moving factor as yet. And I'll go through some of the timelines to look out for. So that's kind of the broader overview. But let's get down into some of the headlines that have been coming out and, and they're in focus. So this was the thing yesterday. Um, so let me get you up to speed of what's happened. So obviously it was back in November of last year that uh, the US imparted you know, fresh sanctions on Iran. However, that came with several exemptions or waivers on specific countries. Uh, particularly those that were the biggest buyers of Iranian crude. So all in all, a strong political message from Trump domestically, but a fairly watered down approach in terms of its actual impact on Iran. Um, and that meant that Iran was OK with that happening. However, what we saw then was after that six month waiver elapsed and that didn't get renewed, this was towards the end of April, well then the sanctions really start to bite because that really starts to impact Iran and that was really the beginning of seeing these tensions flare up. So what's happened? Well, we've had the, the frequency of attacks, not that it's new, but it's become more regular. Um, the kind of proxy war against Saudi Arabia via the Houthi uh, rebels in the left part of where uh, Yemen is situated in the southern tip of Saudi Arabia, if you like, in that geographic region. So they've become much more frequent in terms of those attacks. Uh, and as a response then, military personnel has increased within the area from the allied Western forces, particularly America. And then Iran sees that as quite hostile action. You've then had the two vessels attacked last week, which of course has uh, seen this flare up further. And now this latest development this week where uh, a drone got shot down, uh, a US drone apparently by Iranian forces. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. Now, a couple of different things uh, I just wanted to look at. One is, well, this is the, the region here. I think if I'm right, I wasn't actually in the office at the time last week when the, the vessel attacks were happening, but I believe it was similar. The Gulf of Oman going into strategically what is the world's most important choke point of the seaborne traffic of oil, counting for 30% of the entire movement of oil on the planet at any one point in time. So hence the reason why oil prices are so sensitive to this particular region, the Strait of Hormuz, the northern tip of Oman and here southern area of Iran. Now these latest reports is what we had and this is where it becomes a slightly gray area is that obviously Iran are saying they shot it down because the US drone was flying within Iranian airspace. Now obviously the history of these two countries goes back a very long way. I mean the last time there was actually military confrontation between Iran and the US you've got to go all the way back to 1988. Um, the US um, I think the campaign at the time praying mantis was what happened when uh, they targeted various different, I think at the time it was uh, Iranian warships. But then what happened at that point was on the other side, which is again has this hor uh, historical significance of the tension between these two nations, is that the US uh, accidentally shot down a Iranian uh, civil aircraft which had 300 civilians on board and said it was a case of mistaken identity. So. You know, it's a very messy past and hence the reason why uh, this can flare up and this confrontation can rise pretty rapidly. A um, couple of things though to be aware of, I mean, I was just looking at the particular aircraft that got shot down and I was talking to some of the guys here yesterday. This isn't exactly the drone that you would visualise in your head that gets flown around Hyde Park in London at the weekend. This is a whole nother level. Um, I was looking at the value, I think the actual value of this aircraft, I looked at it this morning, it was 175-ish uh, million dollars per aircraft. It's about the same size as, as, a, uh, as a Boeing 737 in terms of its wingspan and, and size. So um, yeah, not a, not a small piece of kit at all, but obviously built for doing high surveillance work from an American perspective of what Iranian activity is when you're sanctioning them about their nuclear ambitions. Now, the point being here is that Trump initially said 
uh, he actually tweeted something along the lines of Iran, you know, you better watch out type of phrase. Now, you definitely have to understand here um, the kind of balance of consequence and the objective that Donald Trump has here of what he needs to manage. Now, who is it that responds and reports and follows his Twitter account? Well, you know, it's the mainstream media that will obviously jump on this and push the, push the envelope and be pumping what he's saying. And so Trump knows this. So he talks a pretty tough, aggressive game on Twitter. And apparently he was in the stages of planning a military intervention. However, he then said, oh, actually, it was probably just a loose and stupid individual. And probably it was unintentional. So actually, what he's, what he's trying to do here is he's got two real things he needs to manage. One is he needs to appease um, the voting electorate who most likely would, uh, it would resonate with taking quite aggressive action in the Middle East. So he needs to stand firm on that in a public perception. However, he knows that any type of military engagement with Iran could cause oil prices to spike aggressively higher, which would be the absolute opposite of what he would need going into what's going to be uh, now, what's underway, a formal um, presidential campaign period for his second term. So he can't afford to have a military confrontation from a political point of view in respect to potential implications for the costs of an artificial tax, if you like, on higher prices for the middle class in America. The other thing, of course, is um, well, a few other things. One is who are closely aligned with Iran as a country? Well, that's when you start talking about the indirect relationships of the people like China and US, of course, are in the middle of a trade war with China. And then you also talk about Russia. So if you start flaring up tensions with Iran, yes, that is the first person in front of you. But you are indirectly also engaging with the likes of China and Russia. So it does get very complicated and escalates very quickly. Not only that, though, it costs money if you want to start you know, going into this level. And also, it, it kind of detracts from what Trump wants to push, which is this idea about China and the trade war and US competitiveness and also immigration. You know, so he's probably going to be very reticent to start going down this other route and spending money where Ideally, he wants to be using that capital and getting signed off in Congress to spend on fiscal measures domestically. So with all this being said, the reason why I've gone over it in quite detail is I do not think Trump will engage militarily at any type of sizable level with Iran because of all these reasons, it's not in his best interest. And you saw that, I think, play out yesterday. You know, he sounds aggressive, but at the end of the day, He's not going to do anything because he can't afford to do anything. There's too much at stake here beyond just the obvious, which is Iran. So, yeah, more military personnel in the region, sure. But seeing an actual, you know, bombing of an area, I think that's not going to happen. Um, let's not forget that when it comes to the three major countries which Trump has had to face within his short term as president, North Korea and Iran are very different to Syria. When it comes to Syria, for one, Syria doesn't have any real uh, natural resource that has any type of implication, like on the price of oil, which is the main reason why he'd be reticent to have any confrontation with Iran. And then North Korea, you have a problem militarily with North Korea, you've got a big problem with China. And you have a big problem with China, that's not just a big problem, that's, that's gonna be, uh, something you, you know you wouldn't ever want to, to to go into so if anything he kind of ratcheted up the North Korea hit the barrier he's, I think he's doing the same here and he'll hit the same with Iran you know this isn't Syria he can he can command air, aerial airstrikes on Syria but he wouldn't contemplate doing that in my opinion with Iran for the reasons mentioned so from a trading point of view to summarize um, I think that there's still definitely more upside potential for oil because I do think that markets will become almost hypersensitive to these types of developments at the moment. And quite interesting, oil, yeah, you know, when we were looking at it breaking down in the price action when the price was falling, you know, you can kind of see it quite clearly when the price was 
was, was moving lower, how prices tend to respond. So on the move back up, like yesterday, we get up to these areas of resistance of where we've previously also come uh, up to when we were rallying at the beginning of the year. Uh, and you know, this is when you, you've got to be aware that you know, a, a day of moving three, four, possibly five bucks in oil is definitely not off the table when this type of news flow you know, is flying around. For me, I think, I think overall, just given the, the, the news items at play, and I think the G20 does hold uh, some importance for the price of oil because whether or not they can continue to progress with these, um, the, the conversations between US and China and help the demand side of the equation, I do think 60 is quite a sweet spot I think that would be a good area of resistance if we did punch higher. I don't think that's an unreasonable kind of target in the medium term. Um, beyond that point, if we get above 60, I think that's when you start seeing Trump um, start opening up the verbal intervention, trying to look to force the Saudis, if you like, to pump more oil and so on and so forth to try and move the price back down. I do think Trump's threshold for higher oil prices is going to get ever lower as we get closer into the run into the 2020 uh, kind of uh, presidential election. Anyhow, enough on oil. A uh, couple other things I wanted to mention. We have got the flash service and manufacturing PMIs coming out this morning. These are important for the euro. With that being said, just putting the euro on a one minute chart, you've probably, if you're trading as I'm speaking, seen the euro explode higher. That's because manufacturing PMI in, in France just came in at 52, above the expected 50.7. The services figure, 53.1, above the expected 51.5. That's pretty decent beats there for France, which has been struggling, particularly on the service side at the beginning of the year, kind of end of Q1, after those uh, yellow jacket protests that were impacting the service sector. Manufacturing as well, seeing a healthy rebound. So decent little pop there in the euro. Uh, on the back of that, just getting above uh, the overnight Asia-Pacific high. So yesterday's high, worth keeping an eye on as I'm talking, 13.94 on the upside. Uh, German data will be coming out um, shortly at half parts, so we'll try and wrap up the briefing for that release. Quick run through then um, of other headlines, and then I'll get Sam on, on the technicals, but you probably already saw the news. Uh, Michael Gove, lots of talk about um, a word that I've never used, probably because I didn't go to Eton, but skullduggery was going on apparently in, in Westminster, um, and they were talking about the fact that it was uh, it was manipulated in order that uh, Boris didn't go against Gove, given the you know the, the historical nature of their relationship when they had a bit of a backstabbing issue when they originally ran in 2017, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's going to be Johnson Hunt going through so what I wanted to do is have a quick cycle through some infographics just to make sure you're um, up to speed um, so you're gonna have I think it's 16 um, hustings and if you if you're not familiar with what that is basically it's debates and um, the two of them are going to be debating off on various different issues about how they're going to lead the country but obviously brexit the big one um, and this is so that basically over the coming weeks that the, the grassroots Tory members, which comprises of 160,000 people nationally, can vote then in time for, by the 22nd of July, a new leader gets announced. Um, so there's postal ballots that need to take place. So you're gonna hear lots of what I can do and things like how I'm gonna change Britain and all these types of things. I wouldn't really, I would only see this as impacting the pound. Basically, if again, as I've said a week, if Boris John it's Boris Johnson's to lose essentially and what I mean by that is this is what the bookies are pricing for who's going to be the next prime minister the bookies have Boris Johnson to become the next leader at about 92 percent that's how big the gap is at the moment so uh, you know it's it's Boris's to lose now if this was anyone else I would say they've pretty much got it sealed here it's done but we're talking about Boris Johnson and so the only thing here is if he makes a, a mistake over the coming weeks in these debates, he says something in the press. Remember, the press will be poking him every day because they want to get a response. Um, that, if, that, um, if those two lines, the red and blue, start to um, converge, I would say the more they converge, the more pound positive that is. 
the closer it gets that Hunt potentially has an opportunity that he could actually seriously win, I think that would be a slight removal then of this idea that you're going to get the more stronger no-deal candidate uh, in number 10, is how I'd kind of interpret that. Yeah, these were just the numbers. Uh, this was an interesting survey that was done on Thursday, and this was, con this was a survey of a sample size of about 1,200 Conservative Party members. And as you can see here, you know, a significant gap where majority are backing Boris Johnson, hence the reason the bookies are so favourable on his side. OK, PMIs are very important this morning, so I am going to come off the mic, uh, the German one in particular. Um, otherwise, quick overview, you've got um, US the equal measurements coming out. Manufacturing service flash PMIs this afternoon at 2.45, existing home sales at 3. You've got a cluster of speakers coming out as well um, throughout the morning. Feds Rosengren shortly, uh, Feds Daily and non-voter at 11.30. You've got Bank of England speaker as well, Tenreiro, coming out at 1.30, Mester at 5 o'clock. So do be aware of the speakers as well. And one thing I haven't mentioned, but just to finish on, I believe it is quadruple witching today. Now, what I'll do is when, I, when we finish this briefing, I'll come back on the mic and I, for any of the new traders, I'll explain what quadruple witching is. But in summary, it means you're probably likely to see extra volatility around specific points upon expiration of these contracts in the futures and options uh, stock and single um, stocks, for example. I'll explain more uh, later, but it just means that these various points in the day, so if you were trading the euro stocks at 11 a.m., the DAX at midday, the CAC I think is three, the US indices at the open, they could be particularly volatile around those points in time. But I'll give you some more info later. All right, let me hand you over to Sam then. I wish you a good day and, uh, and a pleasant weekend. PMI German number coming out will be important, so keep your heads up. Hi <clears throat> right, guys, hope everyone uh, has had a good week so far and, and, and keeping with the the tennis theme of of clothing wear. I've got my Lacoste polo on after Andy Roddick. The, uh, oh yeah, Djokovic is actually the most recent Wimbledon winner. But more so for, for Roddick, the, the best player of my generation, despite Federer. Um, having a look over the, the currencies, we'll start with the, uh, with the pound here, which you can see. Yes, there was, was quite undecided about where to go and there's a certain level, if I just remove all the, the studies on here that I want to keep an eye on as we go into the back end of the week. Uh, on the futures coming in around 127.20 uh, but of course it will look similar in all different charts where you can see uh, these lows going back from the beginning of the month the 4th, the 10th and the 13th before we had a bit, uh, a bit of a breakdown there. Again on the, the Fed we found good resistance came back to uh, what was the previous high of the day broke through and found support again there uh, well yesterday uh, afternoon so keeping an eye on that for, for where we close. Can we uh, get back below there and, and drift lower, or is this now the start of a, well, a shorter term, medium term push on? To the upside, obviously keeping an eye on the, the highs of the, the day and just a bit above that. Didn't quite make it, but the, the breakdown point that we had on the 12th, uh, 127.82 would be somewhere to, to keep a close eye on uh, as well. Also, just looking at uh, the pound with this trend line from those highs, there's a potential point of interest should we get above there as well uh, would be the third test but also coming in around 128 by the time it would uh, would mark up and and some of the highs back on the afternoon of the 12th uh, as well to the downside having a quick look at the trend line from the 17th is the high we found a bit of support there despite a, a false break uh, coming through as well so keeping a, a close eye on these levels just perhaps getting squeezed in uh, a touch from both directions. Uh, you've got obviously five minutes for the German figures, so we'll have a quick look over Euro, just how we're trading now. Um, again, it's similar to the pound. And just having a look at those trend lines from the high, we'll be looking to come in around R1. You've got some important levels there, 114 just before. Uh, you've got uh, another, this, again, this is similar to the pound in that the lows of the 12th before we did push lower. Uh, that would be looking to, to come in uh, there as well. Around the pivot, another area that I'd be, be focusing on, you can see from, if I just put this on a 15 minute uh, time period, the, the low that we had in the Asian session yesterday uh, marked up to 
uh, the lows of yesterday to, and then today as well uh, around that pivot. So that's a, a key level to be keeping an eye on uh, as a line in the sand. Uh, and if we can get a push through there, then uh, we might see a further breakdown. Those highs of yesterday, quite important. Uh, and again, where we close the week will be key. If we can really push on above 114, you might get a, a further push higher. Uh, and again, f talking of further push highers, the Aussie dollar is certainly one to keep an eye on. That uh, test of the yearly low, really strong reaction. For us to get excited, I would say we need to get above 69.60, 69.61. Basically, what was the low, again, it's the same day here of the 12th. Uh, before we had that breakdown so really keeping a, a close eye on that to the downside if we were to get a push below the pivot i think then we might see uh well dollar strength across the board uh, but more importantly for this market uh the sign that we have maybe just had a top failure to to push on from yesterday's high however we are still uh, pretty much flat for the day so pivot just below uh, above and below our one would be an area i'd be keeping uh, a close monitor on for where this market goes the yen doing its own thing um this morning and, and pushing lower uh, against the the dollar the dollar pretty much uh, flat if anything under under a bit of pressure uh, but key level here to keep an eye on just below where we're trading yesterday's high and you can see just looking at this chart if we go back to yesterday the lowest point of the uh, european session was the previous day's high as well so keeping a a close eye on what happens around here uh, we know on the longer term chart just how good these retests of, of levels have been. So keeping a monitor uh, on what happens there. And you can see the low of uh, the, the beginning of the week was, of course, the previous high that we had back on the 13th of May. So being technical as of late, so we're keeping um, a close watch on, on proceedings uh, as we go through. The S&P, I think it's just a case you've got to be looking for areas to go long at the moment. Uh, I know Cash Open was... You know, an opportunity perhaps to get short, but that low of the day, previous high of yesterday. So we're looking uh, at this market acting quite technically. Early this morning, uh, we had a break of the, the trend, if you like, from the, the, the high of the day. That broke through, very well respected, decent push just after 7 o'clock. And we're now, uh, you know, just pushing up to near where we, we started the day, uh, 29.56 trading. Opportunity later maybe a break of the uh, the two recent highs 29.60 that would come in and, and look for that continuation higher if we are to drift down obviously s1 and that previous level although being tested already yesterday worth keeping uh, uh, an eye on uh, as well but for me just i think preferring the uh, the the long uh, is the way to to go here having a look, quick look at, at gold i'll try finish in the next 30 seconds if i if i can uh, 1390 pretty key previous highs haven't been uh, retest retested the pivot also key where this trend line would look to to come in um, as well we'll get on the mic throughout the, the day but with that uh, level being hit I think the, the balls will stay in control if we can stay above the pivot uh, which with uh, how things are trading you would expect that You've got 20 seconds uh, until the the data uh, comes out um, but I hope you'll have a, a great trading day and an even better weekend.